Hi, Lori. Hey, Sean. How are you? Good. How old are they? About How long do they live? Um, if they just sat around and did nothing, they can get into their 20s. Um, when they're big like this and they work pretty hard, then what happens is their knees wear out, so yeah. probably in their early to mid teens. Yeah. They're beautiful. Mm. I'll show you. Yeah, you're going to see. He won't, he won't have to tell you the answer, you'll get to watch the answer. Huh. What are their names? Rock and, oh, rock and Star. <laughs> which one's Rock and which one's Star? This one's Rock over here. Nice. That's what happens when your kid's name will be like Rock Star. Oh no! What is this? Who's Who's this? 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 <laughs> yeah, they're pretty proper. Huh? Yeah. Yes. Hi. You're sweet. I'm like a kitty cat. <laughs> You're like a big kitty cat. Huh? Are you a big kitty cat? <laughs> Hello there. Yes. What a nice office you are. Look <laughs> how warm he is. It's so warm. He's so warm. And you. No, look at me. You must be salty. Tom. <coughs> yep. Darling, what a great turnout. Thank you so much. I'm Lori Sanders. I'm one of the co-directors of Historic Northampton. And I am thrilled by the weather and thrilled that you're all here. Um, if some people in the back can't see, we can also, some people, I mean, since we have amplification, thanks to Steve Trumpy from Hits 94.3. Play the um, radio! <laughs> I also want to thank our other sponsors who are Northeast Solar, um, Greenfield Savings Bank, the Northampton Community Arts Trust, Woodstar Cafe, and Tom Jenkins of Blue Dog Forestry. Thank you all, all, all to all our sponsors. Um, after Tom's presentation, we are going to go along the driveway, which hopefully is still passable, and then we'll go out onto Bridge Street once the police come at probably around quarter of 12, and we'll walk down uh, Bridge Street, probably for the first time in 200 years that Oxen are doing real work in downtown Northampton. <laughs> And then we'll go to the Community Arts Trust where you're all uh, welcome to have coffee and cider. So yeah! thank you all so much for coming and here's Tom Jenkins. Alright, so I thought I was going to come try my oxen. Now here I am talking in a microphone. Uh, so I'll just try and answer all the typical questions first and uh, we can move on from there. So uh, I got my first team of oxen I think when I was about eight. Um, it's kind of a family tradition. My grandfather and great-grandfather did it. Um, my grandfather used to say that I was seventh generation um, driving oxen on the same land in West Hampton. Um, Yay. Yeah, so uh, when I was a teenager, I pulled a couple of families worth of firewood with my oxen. Um, I used to uh, show at fairs as a kid through the 4-H program. Um, we would compete at uh, you know probably a dozen different fairs throughout Western Mass in uh, different kinds of competition. Um, then there was several years where I didn't have oxen at all. I went off to college and had a family. Then I wanted my kids to have the same experiences that I did, so I got them a young team. Um, and I really started kind of getting the itch again, and so then I got my own team. Um, I work as a consulting forester, and so. That means I'm the guy that goes out in the woods before the loggers, and I act as a middleman between a landowner and a logger. And I decide which trees get cut and which ones don't, and lay out logging access, and um, help the landowner and the logger um, do sustainable long-term forest management. And I've noticed a shift over the last few years where there's more and more people buying property that don't care about the timber value. 
I talk with a lot of landowners who will tell me, I want to have a healthy forest, but I don't care about making money. And so if maximizing profit isn't our goal, then having large logging machinery isn't the best way to do it. So then I can say, hey, I have this cool alternative. I can come out and harvest very few trees per acre and still be economically feasible. Um, I can skid logs down narrow hiking trails. I don't leave ruts. I don't bang the bark off from trees. I can be really low impact as compared to large logging machinery. So um, I've gotten into doing that and I've been doing more and more of it. Um, it could probably be half of my my job if I if I let it. Um, it's not quite lucrative enough to jump into it full time, but so I've been doing that for you know roughly five years. Um, so this is uh, is Rock and Star. Um, Rock is on your right. Um, Star is over here to the left. Uh, typically, you call the the ox to the right hand side is is your nigh ox or your near ox. Um, star on the other side is in the off position. He's the off ox or the far ox. Um, they know probably about 17, 18 different commands and then I combine them as well. Um, almost all draft animals, uh, horses, oxen, mules, um, sled dogs, uh, everybody uses G and haw. So haw is a left turn and G is a right turn. Um, I heard that goes back to 15th century England um, and we still all use it today. Um, I use the, the whip here um, to give them directions. Now you'll notice I'm not hitting them hard. I don't <laughs> swing it as hard as I can and really smack them with it. I'm just giving them little signals. So you know, if I'm trying to turn and star over here on the far side isn't paying attention to me, I can reach over rock and just give him a little tap on the back and say, hey, wake up. Um, if I want him to turn sharply versus in a wide arc, um, I may hold the stick right in front of one of their noses so that he knows I want him to stop while the other one comes around. Um, to back up, I tap him on the knees with it. But, um, you know, they have thick winter fur on now and cattle have notoriously thick hide anyway. Um, this thing is way too flimsy to hurt them with, even if I wanted to. Um, traditionally, they would have driven them with a stick that they call a goad. Um, they're about four feet long, about a half inch around. Um, I have done that before. Um, every now and then they'll step on my whip and break it, so I'll just grab a stick out of the woods. Um, it's hard for me, these guys are so tall, it's hard for me to reach the off ox with a stick, so that's why I used the longer whip with a little lash on it. Um, that thing that's holding them together, that's called the, the yoke. Um, this is an American style neck yoke. Uh, folks are usually concerned when they see that. They go, oh geez, those poor animals, they got this giant heavy chunk of wood on them right on their neck. Um, you know, if you compare them to horse harnesses, horse harnesses are uh, leather and they have this big padded collar. Um, we don't do that because oxen are wimps like horses. Uh, there's a their spine is much further in their, into their body than you might think it is. And that yoke is sitting on a huge chunk of muscle. And they develop a, a callus under there. So when I take that yoke off, you can see a big lump where it sits. Um, this American style neck yoke is by far the most efficient means to harness an ox. Um, if you, there's been studies that have proven they can pull more than twice as much in a neck yoke as they can harnessed in horse harnesses. Um, the way cattle are built, um, they've evolved so that all their muscle is in their front end or there's more muscle in their front end um, for their putting their heads together and pushing on each other and fighting. All that muscle's in their neck. So putting the yoke up on their neck, we're bringing those muscles into play. Um, we typically hook the chain as short as I can and keep the load as tight behind them as I can. It gives them the ability to get lift up on the log and to, you know, the Teamsters call it getting into the yoke or getting under the load. Um, if it's a really heavy load, we hook it short and they're able to, you know, get their head down and lift up on it while they pull. Uh, in Canada, they use uh, a head yoke which fastens to the back of their head and straps around their horns. 
Um, there's pros and cons both ways. Uh, those yokes take longer to put on um, and longer to get off. It's just not typically the way uh, what you see around here. Um, a lot of third world countries usually call it withers yoke, which is just basically any kind of round piece of wood or sometimes even square piece of wood that they set on their on their neck and tie it on with ropes. Um, and when they pull the that slides back and it's up on their shoulders, it's just not as efficient for the animals as this. Um, so typically we make these yolks out of yellow birch, black birch, um, sugar maple, or elm. This is a really old elm yolk. Uh, the yolk I had before this was uh, elm yolk, which was carved out of an 8 by 10 block of wood. And I was pulling a really heavy log through the woods and I hooked onto a stump and they actually ripped my yoke in half. So um, it's a lot of strength there. So this one I borrowed, it's pretty old. Um, I've been taking it easy on it. I, if I did that again, I would break this one too. So um, These guys are eight years old. I start training them almost immediately as when they're calves. Um, they're about 30 days apart. So uh, star over there is 30 days older. And as soon as I get them, I just, the first order of business is making them like me. So uh, we pet them, we scratch their chins, rub them all over, I feed them with a bottle. Um, and then we'll start leading them around on ropes. And so I'll just put a rope on them and I'll, I'll pull them around. And so I'll, I'll start on haw. So I'll say, say haw and I'll pull them to the left. Not now, Rock. <laughs> and I'll just say it over and over. We'll go around and left turns, you know, for probably 20 minutes, a half hour a day. We'll just go ha, 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 and I'm pulling them to the left, pulling them to the left. And then one day I'll say ha, and he'll turn without me having to pull on him. And then we go and we start on G. And we turn to the right, and I'll say G, 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 and pull them around and pull them around until they learn that. And when they both know that pretty well, then I have a tiny little yoke. We stick them in and start working on it with them together. And at that point, when they're little calves, they learn that I'm bigger and stronger than them, and then they never question it again. <laughs> so as far as these guys are concerned, I'm the boss, and they do what I say. So they're, they're herd animals. Um, you know, elephants, buffaloes, um, almost a lot of herd animals, they, they'll have a matriarch or a patriarch, um, and the herd follows them. So say you got a herd of elephants out on the plain, and the... The matriarch says, okay, time to go find water, and she goes walking off to find water. Everybody follows them, her. Even if they're busy eating, they're like, oh, time to go, and they go follow the matriarch. So in our little three-person herd, um, I'm the boss, and so they, they follow me and do what I want. That's, that's kind of how all this stuff works. So um, I look at this when I'm working with them. I look at this as a three-member team. A uh, team of oxen is, is really three people. It also includes the teamster, me. Um, and I want them to give me their most all the time. And so I try everything I can to make it easier on them. You know, all day long I'm looking to try and figure out how I can make pulling that load easier for them. So, um, and then when I need them to give me 110%, uh, they're there for me. Uh, if I mentioned they're about eight years old, they'll be eight years old next month. Um, oxen can typically work into their early to mid-teens. Um, they can live to be 20 if they just stand around and do nothing. Um, what happens with the big ones like these guys is their knees often wear out. So probably when they're 12, 13 years old, I'll start to notice that they have a really hard time standing up when they're laying down. Um, I'm hoping to get another three or four years out of them working and then uh, I'll give them a few years retirement after that to hang around and get fat and lazy. Um, Oh, one important thing everybody always asks me is, uh, you know, what's the difference between an ox and a cow? So it's all just terminology. Uh, a female is a heifer. When she has her first calf, she's then a cow. Uh, a male is a bull. We castrate them around six months old. That bull is now a steer. A four-year-old working steer is an ox. And it can be any breed. So these guys are a cross between a Holstein and a milking shorthorn, or um, otherwise known as a Durham. So the Holsteins have a, a great temperament. They are, they're easy to work with, they're smart, um, they're easy to find, they're inexpensive. However, um, they get really, really big. 
if these guys were purebred Holsteins, they would easily be 500 pounds larger than they are now. Um, milking shorthorns, um, they were the quintessential New England ox. They were the most popular oxen throughout New England for probably 100 years. Um, they're a little bit smaller, they're much more active. Um, so when we make this cross, we're hoping that we get the intelligence and temperament of the, the Holstein and they stay a little bit smaller like the shorthorn and get some of that shorthorn energy. Um, these guys, as far as oxen go, are pretty energetic and uh, they move pretty quick. Um, partially because their legs are so long, they don't have to move that quick to chew up a lot of ground. But um, The other thing when you cross the Holstein and Milk and Shorthorn is every once in a while you'll get a calf that comes out this cool looking gray color we call Blue Roan. Blue Roan. So those blue roans are rare, and if you can get a pair of them that match, they're worth a lot of money. So, <laughs> Rocky's got something to say. I, I went to look at a pair of blue roans, and uh, they wanted a thousand bucks for them. I had the cash in my pocket. And I had every intention of buying them because I always liked them. And uh, I saw these guys in the stall right next to them, and I asked the farmer, I said, "What are those?" And he said, "Oh, they're out of the same bowl and the same herd of heifers. It's just they came out black and white." I said, well, how much for those ones? And he said, oh, you can have those for 150 bucks. Oh <laughs> so then I, the old Yankee in me kicked in, and I said, hey, for 150 bucks, I like black and white. <laughs> Anybody have any questions that popped up? Or? His horns are just a different shape. They, they came out and curled up, and they were rather sharp. Um, I used to have a riding pony in the pasture with him, and uh, he gored the pony one day. So I put those knobs on just to blunt him up a little bit. Um, Rock, his, his horns are just thicker and blunter, and the knobs didn't fit on. And I always thought I was going to whittle them down and get them on there, but, uh, you know, maybe tomorrow. <laughs> I, I do have a young team. Um, my kids are showing them in 4-H now, and uh, it's my intention it'll be these guys' replacement. So, uh, you know, five more years, these guys will be ready to retire, and that young team will be uh, coming into their prime. Can you explain again the difference is it between a bull and an ox? So a, a bull is an unaltered male. Um, when they're castrated, they're a steer, and a four-year-old working steer is an ox. That goes back to the wagon train days. The freight companies would buy four-year-old steers for use as oxen, and so it just became known that a four-year-old steer was an ox. Am I right in saying that oxen is not the plural for ox? Oxen is the plural for ox. I thought maybe yep. just meant two oxen. In there. No? Okay. Yeah, and any, any more than one. Okay. Are oxen uh, more popular in New England than other places? By far. Uh, you know, it's the old joke, how many New Englanders does it take to change a light bulb? You know, what? Change? <laughs> yeah, so when, when everybody else switched to horses, um, we kept our oxen for another 100 years, and then uh, tractors came into vogue, and kind of we went off the tractors. So, horse, you know, the working horse was never fully as popular in New England as it was everywhere else. Um, oxen are are cheaper to buy, they're cheaper to feed, they're easier to train, they're cheaper to harness. Um, they require a lot less veterinary care, so, so they're cheaper. Um, the real downside is they move slower. But isn't the terrain also a factor in that? It, yes. Uh, these guys will, um, you know, when I'm logging out in the woods, They'll, they'll walk over almost anything. They'll go through brush. They'll push over small trees if I want them to. Um, they, don't, uh, they don't mind doing that stuff. Well, horses won't, won't do that. They don't like walking through slash. You have to, um, horse loggers call it swamping the trails. They throw all the brush and logging slash out of their trails. Um, I don't do frown with that. We just walk right over it. Are they stronger than horse? Um, they're, they're pretty similar. Um, they pull differently. Uh, a large horse, when on a heavy load, will lunge against the load, so they're constantly jumping and banging the load, whereas these guys just lean in and pull hard. So it was kind of interesting, over the summer, um, 
there was a pull-off between horses and oxen up in New Hampshire, and uh, it, was, it was really neat. They, uh, in the heavyweight class, horses took first and second, but then oxen took third through tenth. So I don't know how you interpret that. But. <laughs> I think I'm the only guy, uh, I mean, there's lots of oxen around. Um, polling contests are, are still pretty popular at our fairs. You know, there's probably 30 teams within 20 miles of here. Um, so far as I know, I'm the only guy around that logs with them. Um, there's a few guys logging with horses around. Um, there's Tyler Sage and, and uh, Wendell, and he's doing a job for the city of Northampton right now. Um, Kip Porter up in Worthington logs with horses, too. What's your personality? Um, they're all different. Uh, I would say, you know, they're about comparable to a dog as far as intelligence and personality goes. What do they eat? Um, these guys are almost entirely grass-fed, so they just eat a lot of hay. Um, I feed them two bales of hay a day uh, between the two of them, and then if they're just hanging around and not doing anything, uh, I just give them a tiny bit of grain just so they'll stay in their stall long enough for me to get them hooked up. But uh, if they're working, I'll give them five pounds of oats each a day, so it gives them a little more energy. So I figure it costs me about $10 a day to feed them. Well, they're really apprehensive about walking on the ice. That's why they were hesitant to come in here. So I'm going to try and just pull it a little bit sideways to bust it loose. It's kind of froze in there. And we'll straighten it out and head that way. Back. <laughs> you can stack logs incredibly high this way. Um, I've had log stacks that were, you know, seven, eight logs tall that you can't see over. It was kind of fun. I'd have, you know, 200 feet of rope out there making my big V, and they'd be pulling. I couldn't even see the other side of the log pile, and all of a sudden you'd see a big log popping up in the air. So, um, it's kind of fun. In, in the old days, they would have had a a giant A-frame made out of wood, and they would have had a dedicated team on that, pulling the boat just to so. They would have had ice throws, so they would have slid a sled like this, or one similar to it, up and down the road and packed the trail down, and they would actually have icing sleds that had big water tanks on them that squirted water out of the runner tracks to ice the road. And that way they could haul an enormous load on those iced roads. Uh, the downside is when you get onto uh, a hill, your load will come down and, and hit you. They call it called it being sluiced. So they had a, a bridle chain. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure that's a little sexist. Uh, hold you back. <laughs> so this fits over the runner in front of the, the first bunk. This goes under your runner. And uh, back in those days, they didn't have hardened steel so the way to make something stronger was to make it bigger so that's why those links are so big in the middle of that um, and that would drag along the ground underneath your runner and it gives you more grip on ice to slow your sled down uh, 
All right, so I'm gonna have to go down to the front, go that way. So.